Let's kick you off to the close here on this Wednesday afternoon with David Bonson, the chief investment officer with the Bonson Group. And uh, David, I, I, I feel like we've obsessed so much about the Fed and rates. Look, we're probably going to get some cuts. I don't know whether we're getting six. Should the market really be as laser focused on this? I know it factors into cost of capital, blah, blah, blah. But aren't there other things really driving this market right now? Absolutely. And I think 2024 is a screaming uh, claim of what you're saying. The expectations were moved all the time and markets kept going higher. And every time they recalibrated, it made no difference in risk pricing. The markets know that the Fed's not going higher. The markets know they are going lower. The exact magnitude and the exact speed is totally irrelevant. Corporate profits and the valuation around those profits, that's what's going to drive markets. We're assuming 14 to 15% year-over-year earnings growth, and we're paying 22 to 23 times for that. Mm -hmm. That's what the market pricing is about, not the Fed funds rate. I am curious about the valuation side of things. Uh, Just a a couple uh, yesterday or the day before, I believe, uh, one of our Bloomberg anchors caught up with Aswath DeMotor and uh, Mm a NYU finance professor, a value guy, who was actually saying, look, yeah, historically valuations are high, but he was making the case that valuations aren't nearly as stretched as maybe what those numbers look like on the top line. Um, I've read a lot of those arguments, and that's a very qualified person to make the case, but I want to be real clear. Every time someone starts talking about this time it's different, it never ends up being different. Yeah. Ever. It's just a matter of when it ends up reverting to the mean. Yeah. And and those that are saying it is not as bad as it was in 99 with Cisco and Juniper, that's true. There is far more revenue and far more earnings growth than they had then. However, it is still deeply stretched, and you can use any metric you want, your price to perfection. At some point, when when some quarter comes, when order flow disappoints on something AI related, you have a significant possibility of downside. I mean, we've seen that in the last two summers. We've had a little bit of a tech swoon, and then the money comes in and continues to buy it, whether that's like mechanical buying or retail and FOMO, right? So how can you stand against that? Because it ends at some point. They cannot continue to go through the, the trees. And also, the, the denominator now is $3 trillion of market cap. So to add $300 billion mm-hmm. to the market cap of NVIDIA, you're only going to get 10%. A lot of people think they're going to get another 40, 50, 100%. And now you're talking about trillions of dollars of market cap. But it's not just NVIDIA, right? It's not just the Mag 7, like Salesforce, for example, on real numbers uh, at a record high today, for example. So how do you get the boost without taking on the risk of the more frothy names? You you don't, and that's why I just simply believe it's not a good time to be a cap-weighted index investor. Uh, Even Salesforce would be probably Mag 10, Mag 15. I mean, it's not by any means a a medium capital name. It's still mm-hmm. quite large, but it isn't MAG-7. But I think when you're talking about the, um, those, right now, financials and energy uh, have done extremely well since the election, and no one's talking about it. Their performance has been bigger than that of the tech space. So that's a good thing for the market, that the breadth has, has come out a bit. But no, I don't, I don't think that into next year people can be expecting the same move that you got in 23 and 24. I am curious, though, when we talk about on the sector level, and of course financials have had a pretty good run since the election, I think up about 8% as a group. They were doing well before that. As you know, energy as well. A big part of the bullish case for both of those sectors seems to be the potential for deregulation or at least a lack of uh, aggressive regulation that maybe we saw over the past uh, three and a half years or so. Are you buying into that? Yes, but I would be uh, bifurcating in energy between midstream and upstream Mm. and in financials between asset managers and banks because it's a very different story. And we consider it all one sector, but it's really two totally different stories. Uh, When you look at M&A picking up, when you look at a lower cost of capital, you look at higher margins. Margins. These uh, private equity companies, we own Apollo and Blackstone and Blue Owl, they benefit. Um, net interest margin is the story with the JP Morgan. Um, they have MA, it's a good franchise there, but the bank story is different than the asset managers. Mm-hmm. We're huge midstream yeah. investors, and I can't come up but, with a bad thesis well, on midstream. Can I push back on that? Sure. And I'm going to do my best Jamie Diamond impression because he would push mm-hmm. back on you as well and tell you that basically he's going to just keep buying the stock hand over fist. Uh, when you look at the banks, and, and let's just separate you know, the, the real gems, like a J.P. Morgan, if you will. You can even maybe yeah. throw a Morgan Stanley in there as well. Uh, the, the cash generation there is phenomenal. Huge. And it, see, I feel like every year we get these calls that say, this is the end of it, of, of the run, so to speak. We're going to start to see some real hiccups and bumps here, and they continue to defy those expectations. Well, and uh, by the way, those are the exact two yeah. names that we own, is J.P. Morgan and Morgan yeah. Stanley, and the big banks and, asset, and, and Morgan Stanley is kind of a wealth manager and asset manager. Um, it's the dividend that tells you what do they believe is going to happen on yeah. their own future free cash flow generation J.P. Morgan, and especially Morgan Stanley, have become big dividend growers. J.P. Morgan, we bought around $25 2009. They've grown the dividend 10 times, and 
the stock is up 10 times. Morgan Stanley is the largest dividend in the financial sector. So when the companies are voting with their yield, I think you can have more confidence. I would not feel the same about Citi and Bank of America, certainly not Wells Fargo. Okay, so is that your play for midstream? Because we know that MLPs have nice dividends, but that has some political risk. And I appreciate we have a new administration, but they just got four years to remove, like, risk in terms of, say, inciting new pipelines. Well, yeah, but the issue there is that the pipelines go up in value when you're not building new pipelines. So you like the fact they're not building. No, it's been a, <laughs> look, at it's up 25% per year since Biden was president. So the midstream sector either benefits from new terminals, new export LNG, mm. new pipelines being built, or it benefits the older companies. What it is is the difference between small cap and large cap. We like the large cap companies when they're protecting incumbents. Uh, now hopefully you can get some growth in the space. You need more pipelines being built. All right, David, always a great conversation, always great insights. David Bonson, the chief investment officer at the Bonson Group. 